Hello, adventuresses. Today is a very interesting episode. I'm talking to Ruth from the UK, and Ruth is actually 67 years old. She's a very special lady, and she decided to take her own horse to France, a totally foreign country, and travel around. She spent a year there, and although she had mishap after mishap after mishap, I really think what she's talking about is very valuable, and it's good to learn from her mishaps and misfortunes, and at the same time, to just keep going and keep at it and to not let your spirits get down. And I think you'll hear that a lot today in Ruth's stories. I do just want to mention that our internet connection wasn't always the greatest, so there are a few moments where it breaks up here or there. I've done my best. I spent a few hours trying to edit it all out as best as I could, but unfortunately, there's some of it that I couldn't really save, so I hope you'll bear with me and you'll still enjoy her stories because she's got lots of them. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention our premium membership is still available. The link is going to be in the show notes, but you can find it at equestrianadventuresses.com. And basically, you can give shout-outs on this podcast for yourself or your loved ones. You'll get early access to all of our bonus footage, the podcast, the YouTube channel. We have a whole lot of stuff coming out, so you'll get early access to all of that. And also, if you have a horse business and you want to share with everyone your upcoming horse tour or maybe your horse product or whatever it is, then you're going to want to have some podcast shout-outs or Instagram shout-outs or whatever it is. So be sure to check out our premium membership again at equestrianadventuresses.com. The other thing I wanted to mention is our YouTube show, which is coming out. We are traveling all around the world this year, filming unique and interesting destinations and featuring really cool women just like you listening today. So if you know anyone that you feel deserves to be featured in an upcoming episode or you have a unique and interesting destination that you think we should film, please get in touch. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is our catalog. So if you're interested in traveling or, you know, riding horses in interesting countries, we have for free on our website a 72-page download, and it's called Horse Riding in Every Country. You can get it for free. It's got literally horse riding stables in nearly every country, 180 countries and over 400 different stables. So go and download that for free and then listen to the rest of this podcast episode. And cue the music. We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits, cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity and beyond! And now your host, Crystal Kelly! Hello, adventuresses. I am sitting with Ruth from the UK today, and today we're going to talk about a lot of fun stuff. She's been traveling around uh, even today. It was hard for us to coordinate this call because we were both running around. Um, So yeah, that's that's been our first adventure. So I wanted to welcome to the show Ruth. Hello. Hello. And just before we go and start talking about a lot of your adventures, I just wanted to get a little bit of background about you as far as where are you from and then, you know, how you got involved with horses and then how you started traveling. So uh, I've been in, involved with horses since I was about four. Um, and that's a long time ago. And uh, I've come through the whole kind of range. Was, I started off with fairly traditional uh, horse stuff like Jim Connors and show jumping and I used to run a livery yard, a boarding barn, you call it. And, um, I, you know, cross country and training horses and all that kind of thing. But then one day I, 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 uh, I had took a break. I went to university. I took a break. I had children. And then one day I woke up and I decided that I wanted to ride Western and that I wanted to ride on the range. And basically I had this vision of free riding um, roaming around the plains, really, like a cow. And I moved to Dartmoor in Devon, which was kind of the nearest thing in England that I could find to um, to a kind of prairie. And uh, I started to ride western. Um, I got I got a horse. Um, ended up with a mare and uh, so on, and it ended up and that one wasn't any good. So then I ended up getting a companion. She wasn't rideable. And um, eventually, I, I uh, bought a decent horse. And he was a Criollo, an Argentine Criollo that come all the way from Argentina. And he was a really well-trained Western horse, um, very steady. And I started to nurture this dream of uh, riding him abroad, riding out here. I was getting fed up with the UK. And um, 
I just had a dream to ride him in another country. I had done quite a few riding vacations in all sorts of places, um, including like Iceland and Tenerife, uh, America, um, certain, a couple of places in the States, Arizona, I rode, I rode from Tucson once to the Mexican border. But this was all about taking my own horn. So just a little bit like, you know, I'm from America, so Western is pretty common. You can find it easily. But here in the UK, I have to say, I haven't really seen very many Western saddles or Western riders. It's not really as big here. So It's very, very small. And it also tends to be quite competitive. And people do the kind of competition Western. They like to do Western pleasure and they like to do trail horse and they like to do, um, you know, that kind of a thing, showmanship. But people don't ride like you, like in the prairies of America. And we, we really don't use horses for work here. I mean, you know, we don't go out and round up the cows or anything. Mm. Farmers have quad bikes. Right. So, so was that your fantasy? Did you just start herding sheep or how did that work? <laughs> the horses are not work. <laughs> yeah. They're not really work animals, although mine was trained apparently on a ranch, although he doesn't seem that uh, keen on cows. But um, so Western is is a small thing and I had not really wanted to do it competitively. I mean, I would quite like to, but there's nothing around me. But my kind of thing in my head, my my vision was just like not going far from what the English picture is of riding around the block, you know, like going out and coming back and just having a trot around the village or whatever, you know, and then or dressage around the arena. My mind was just about and this horse seemed to inspire that in me. He's called Salvador. And um he he just made me want to go and not come back really. So in two thousand eleven I took him for a Dartmoor, which kind of set the seeds for what I was doing. I mean, it was just kind of, you know, I just wrote a few miles a day and I stayed with a friend and then met up with somebody at the pub. And it was lovely, you know, but it wasn't really a long ride as such. Um, but then I just wanted to, to do this ride overseas somewhere. So it really narrowed down to France or Spain because I couldn't realistically see getting many further than that. So what what was the next step? So you have your horse and you decide, I'm going to go riding around and do my oh, cowgirl yeah. thing. <laughs> Um, well, I should add at this point that I'm in my late 60s, so um, it was, it was, you know, kind of time was bearing up on me. I was, I was feeling like, I better do this, you know, now or never. Um, and uh, I talked about it for years. I just couldn't seem to, to do it. It just felt too difficult. I have three other horses as well, and I couldn't really work out how I could leave the others and take him and how, you know, just how to do it. But somehow or other, um, I did it. But it wasn't easy because what happened is two years before I did it, he almost died. And I still hadn't done this. I'd been talking to everyone. I'm going to take him to France. I'm going to ride him in France. And then he got this colic and he just almost passed. I mean, he he was very, very ill with it. And I wasn't even there. I was away, which kind of I'm not sure if it was better or worse. But um, to not be better to be away. But I was just so worried for him. And he, he, you know, the vet said, oh, I don't think he'll make it, you know. <laughs> and I just sat up the whole night praying because I'm like really spiritual person and I do practice chant, lunar yoga and meditation. And so I chanted for a miracle that night. I was sat in a hotel room in Barcelona. I spent the whole night awake chanting. And, you know, the vet sort of gave him up for dead. He said, well, I've put him on. We'll just see what happens. Anyway, the next morning, he, he like he was looking over the box asking for hay. So that was when I made the vow that I'm going to do this. And then I spent the next two years pulling that together to do And then a year ago, I got on the boat and I went. So and where, that was how it started. What was your planning? Did you have like a map or a vague idea? <laughs> or? Planning? Oh, uh, yeah. Somewhere between, I had maps. I'd been looking at maps for a long, long time. I mean, somebody who'd ridden in France gave me a lot of maps. But France is a vast country. I mean, I should, should add at this point, I decided on France and ruled out Spain. Large, because my horse is barefoot, and um, Spain is quite rocky. You know, it's quite hard to travel very fast. Most of the terrain is, some of it's not, but some of the areas of northern Spain that I looked at, I'd gone out a few, few times to 
the rest. And I thought, well, maybe it wouldn't wouldn't be that easy to move very fast on his feet. So I up there's still grass, and and I'm up just for France. But um, I thought it'd be easier to get feet and lots of horse care than Spain, which can be a bit rough and ready, really. Um, so that was it. Um, so I did have maps. Um, I'd been looking at a map called Equestrian Tourism in France um, for years. Not very good map. Because it sort of says that there's a lot of places to stay. There's a lot of gites to stay. A gite is like a an overnight hostel or or somebody's room somewhere where they take the horse as well. But it didn't actually say where they were, and it didn't mark the trails. So I set the three maps against each other. I got the Grand Rondonne map, which is the map of the hiking trails, and then numbered. And then I got the local area, the blue maps, which are kind of the Ordnance Survey maps. And then this equestrian tourism map. And I kind of tallied them all up together and sort of there. And I, I didn't know where to go because it's such a huge country. And I was like, oh, well, I don't really know where I'm going. But I just spoke on Facebook. I put it out on Facebook. And that kind of then took on a life of its own. And people from a similar area started to contact me and say they'd like to join in they'd like to help they'd like to put me up that kind of thing so um that's how it started so it started just south of limoges which is southwest france um it's where the horse got taken to right so did you have um i mean as far as arranging the transport did you have a vehicle arranged to drop him there and then i don't yeah. know pick you up at the finish or no i just sent him on a i just sent him on a horse transport um a horse transporter and I just had my car um at that time I mean it all got far more complicated and convoluted but I just had my car my dog and my one horse mm. and so he got yeah he got dropped at, with this woman who said she wanted to ride with me right and was your goal then so now you're driving you park your car you get on your horse do you just leave your car there for months or <laughs> yeah 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 well, well, then, then the reality hit. Right? It's like, what are we actually doing here? And she could only ride for a week with me, so she started off with me, and we basically just rode south because my route. I had worked out by this time that my route was going to go south, and I was going to go right down to the far southwest and hopefully head towards Spain. But the route itself wasn't really clear. Only the first part of the route. And this lady that was accompanying you was she British yeah. or was she French? She's British. She lives in she lives in France and she's also called Rue. Oh, okay. And he has a, a cob called Ted, a gypsy cob. And he was she hadn't done anything really like that with him. And basically, we just set off, and that was it. And then <laughs> we set off with our tents, our ropes, <laughs> our Side tins of sardines, you know, emergency supplies, water, loads of kit, and we just set off. And I mean, the first day was absolutely crazy. It took us all morning to get going, and I think we managed all of about an hour <laughs> when we stopped for tea with some English people, and they said, "Do you want to stay the night?" And we were like, "Should we?" Well, we've only done an hour, <laughs> so. Um, we decided, you know, even though it was a lovely place, we'd better head on. So we headed on, and then that's when it started to become all, all a bit scary, really, because we just didn't know where we were going to get. But luckily, uh, my friend was still, my, my riding buddy was still on her home ground, so she managed to call up somebody who had a barn, and um, we stayed there the first night, and it was absolutely freezing at night. And then we, it, it was hot, but by day and freezing by night. And we just headed off to south, doing as much as we could and never really knowing where we were going to stay. First night was okay. It was a bit grim. From village to village, I was going to stay in people's jeeps. You know, I was going to stop at the pub, the, the cafe, and have and have a coffee and a glass of wine. And you, It just didn't happen like that. I mean, there was nothing. I think there, there was, you know, we went five days without passing even a shop. Right. And and how was your French? Were you able to communicate? I'm assuming that they didn't speak a lot of English if you're yeah, in the countryside. There was not hardly anybody. We didn't meet anybody. I mean, you know, we literally saw hardly anybody from day to day. 
So my French is really good. I'm fluent, and I'm really fluent now after being there for a year. But um, we just had to kind of get to a point where we were just tired and tie up. But luckily, my horse um, went on the high line, so I had a rope, which um, I just tied from tree to tree and a kind of carabiner and a hook and a, a line, and he just kind of stayed like that all night. And as far as so... You know, let's get a little bit technical, like your saddlebags. How heavy are they? How much a day's worth of food is in there? What? How much food for the horse are you carrying? What's What's the technical? Okay, well, we didn't carry food for the horses. So the system with the horses, because it brings time, lush up there in, in the Limousin, um, we would stop every hour and a half and give the horses a snack. And basically, uh, they would eat alfalfa, which was growing, they would have very lush grass, and that seemed to work pretty well, you know, with the horses. They're both pretty good doers, and they ate as we went on the road. And um, then at night, we would graze them for a while at dusk and then tie them up and then graze them again at dawn. And they actually stood pretty quietly all night, and they showed when they wanted to graze, they would start kind of snacking, and we could see them because they were outside, and then we'd take them to hand graze. So we didn't need to do any supplementary feeding, which was great. That is why I had chosen France as opposed to Spain, because we couldn't have carried it. We did not have a backup vehicle at that time, and we didn't carry fencing. That came later in the ride when I did the Pilgrim's Trail. We carried a corral, and that was a whole other ball ballgame, um, because the person I rode with at that time didn't uh, trust a horse to tie up. Um, so, But anyway, the first part of it, um, that was what we did. Um and we'd untie, you know, we'd just loosen the girth at tea break and we'd take up all the tack for lunch and we'd have a long one and a half, two hour break at lunchtime. And then we'd probably stop, um, we'd probably stop around about four or five for the evening. And that was all fine until one night we arrived at this idyllic riverside spot and someone said to us, Camp beautiful. And so we tied up the horses and we'd lit a fire and we'd made this dinner and we're just going to bed for the night in our tents, and these, these ravers arrived in vans um, with very, very loud music to party and insisted we move the horses, and it was nearly dark, and um, we refused, and we said they should go somewhere else, and they said, no, we should go somewhere else, and they were probably on drugs and everything. It was, like, so scary. <laughs> and um, so that was a pretty bad night. Um, and each night you didn't really know what you'd find, you know. But the next night we found a campsite with, even though they're not really allowed to take horses, they took. They said they would take the horses, and they were so kind. And somebody brought us beers and eggs, and you know. So that was a really good night. So it just went like that, you know. And, and as you find it. And how was the terrain at this stage of the of the ride? The terrain is great. I mean, it was quite a bit of road work linking up the trails um but the first first few days we were on the road mainly and a few like the thing about france which is really really good is that it has a lot of grass ridges that are mowed so every community or commune goes out mowing the grass so you can basically follow grass verges along the road and then they're super smooth and mowed so you can you know you can run and so you can get off the road that way if there isn't a trail but then we picked up a trail called the gr46 we are going around an a46 and that went up and down hills and through forests woods and and that was stunningly beautiful really i mean that area is very beautiful the limousine very quiet and pastoral rural and then you know there were some small towns and rivers we you know we had these collapsible buckets <laughs> you know they sounded good in theory but they were not up to the job they were really not man enough for for our terrain so we would kind of if we couldn't get the horses to water we would scale down banks and things to <laughs> fill up these portable buckets and, and um to give the horses water but they wouldn't drink from them really they didn't really like them <laughs> and then you know what our kit started to collapse so that did you cut great the buckets the handles came off and the <laughs> things dropped off and you know <laughs> we were a lot tied up with 
with Baylor Twine and everything was kind of, you know, got a bit harder. <laughs> and and had you overpacked early on or? No, brilliant, absolutely perfect. Um, the packing was really good and um, I was very happy we, we had enough food, we, we had enough everything i mean you know i probably could have done with a bit more laundry but you know hey um it was it was it was pretty good the packing and i think you know just right for horses to carry so that 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 section worked really well how much like weight wise do you think the horses were carrying uh well i think they were probably carrying another mm, probably 20 kilos and and were Maybe, you i can't really say but my Mine had the saddle and then we had the tent, which is a very small two-man tent. I mean, when me and the dog, you know, the two men. Um, a very small, lightweight tent. Um, uh, I had two packs on the side that had my sleeping bag. And um, it was it was hard to stuff it up. If you didn't pack it right every day, you were in trouble, you know. You just had to pack it perfectly. It took absolutely ages to pack in the morning saying oh we must leave early before the flies come in but we never did because the packing took ages <laughs> and um you know it just was like you had to get really perfect um you had to get the system right um but the horses seemed pretty happy with it and uh yeah so tent collapsible buckets um dog food dog water bowl um little tiny brush for the horses a little tiny hoof pick and see um raincoats uh, and rain trousers didn't really need them too much which was good a uh, spare pair of, spare pair of trousers a couple of undies pajamas toothbrush <laughs> that was about it really i'm not really sure what, and all my ropes and uh, and um halters and things for tying up and you know that was about it really perfect Pretty limited what, and and oh, yeah and so at this point, you know, how long have... So your friend rode with you for about a week, and then you separated. And then what happened yes. after that? Yeah. But then I was short of where I want to be, which I'd wanted to be in the Dordogne, because my next person had said she'd put me up in the Dordogne. And um, I, was an, I was like, we hadn't ridden far enough. We hadn't got there. And so I was an hour short by, by truck. So... I managed to get somebody who was on my Facebook group because I had a lot of supporters and people who were interested in following. And a lady came with a, a, a trailer and drove me down to my next point. And um, so I went to the door doing. And that didn't work out. I mean, that really went wrong badly um, because the lady I'd been going to stay with who wanted to trail ride with me just was too busy and couldn't come and she didn't even have what she said she'd had I she said she had fields so to me fields are things that have enclosures around them you know <laughs> but what she actually had was she just used people's land in the middle of nowhere and put electric fencing around it and that's quite common in France so it didn't have water and I was quite worried about leaving my horse in that situation, although he was fine. Um, and so I needed to get out of there and get on. That became uncomfortable for me, staying there. So I did some lovely riding around the door doing them. You can't complain. I just did an hour here and there, you know, in the mornings. And, and that was fine. And I lived in various caravans and various people's houses and things like that but you know I was anxious to get on but what happened is it started to get hot and in France when it gets hot it's really hot and there's a lot of flies and this had now taken me to the end of June and I was not looking at being able to continue on the trail so I needed to find somewhere to kind of rest up and just be able to ride early in the morning, but I couldn't. You couldn't. I couldn't really have continued on the trail um, at that in that heat. Um, so I just made my way down, and at that point, I called a guy to bring my trailer and and truck over from the UK because I felt very. Um, I felt very uh, vulnerable without my own transport so then, to move if things didn't work out, which they. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, so things start to go downhill. You know, you've only been riding for a little while at this point, yeah. and you have this, I don't know, big adventure planned, and it's not quite the sunset in the prairie like you imagined, maybe. So do you start yeah. to think, oh, should I just go home, and that was enough? Or, you know, what was yeah. next? Yeah, I'd already said I would have gone home in June, end of June. That was originally my plan. But what happened next was that this lady, Vicky, who's an endurance rider down in um, in uh, near Bordeaux, had tried to make me stay till September when she was free. And she was like, just stay till September. I want to ride with you. Just stay, just stay. And we'll, you know, and it was so beautiful. And my horse was happy. He was doing very well. Because at this point, I drove him down to a place called the Gere. Sicony, which is way far down now we're talking about near the Pyrenees um, it was like five hours drive down for me and um, I got down there and I found a farm which belonged to the sister of a friend of mine and they had horses there and it was a huge farm with a huge barn and they said that my horse could stay there so my plan was pretty much to leave him there until it cooled down a bit and decided you know and at that point I was coming back to England and going back and coming back visiting my family and so on because it was so hard I couldn't I couldn't um you know I couldn't trail ride I couldn't continue on so all I could do is like just ride around the local area which was stunning I mean I it was amazing to see the different ride in the different areas of France and the, the, they kind of look after my horse for a few days and, and so it went on like that and then basically the, the summer was just uh, right off with riding really, except for the odd hour early in the morning. And then it came to the end of August and this lady turned up to ride with me and off we went again. And we decided we would go on the Pilgrim's Trail, which is the Chemin Saint-Jacques, which goes down to Spain, down to Santiago. And um, we, we were going to ride that. And that was a different system really with her because she didn't want to tie up to a high line she wanted fencing so with her we had her husband come um with a tr with a truck and trailer and kind of go up every day and and bring all the kit so we didn't have to carry so much stuff and was she also um, british or was she french or yeah she was also british she was also british and um living out there again for, for a long time and um we we so that was a whole different thing. So we we set off on that. Um, I think it was the sixth of September last year. We set off um, from from the place I, I had a mobile home I was living in with the horse, and we set off uh, in the morning and and headed to the beginning of the trail, the trailhead, which was two hours from where I was staying, which is only a few kilometres, but um, it was a kind of twisty route. route. So there. And we set off on the Pilgrim's Trail, very excited, taking pictures of the markers. You know, we're on the Pilgrim's Trail, done it, this is my dream. And, and um, we got to the lunch stop, which was this beautiful old chapel with a meadow. And the horses had only met the night before. And um, they seemed very good together. And we just let them graze, because it was very lush grass, while we were, <laughs> while we were uh, untacking and things like that. And then Mouse, the, he's a very fast Connemara, he's an endurance horse, just got a fly on him and sat off. A dog. And mine, who's really very quiet, followed. And they just went off and we lost them. And um, it was just very stupid of us to do that, you know. We shouldn't have done it. But we lost them. And that was an absolute nightmare because we didn't know where they'd gone because it was in the, vines, the, the vineyards. And they're just endless, endless land and vineyards. And they just could have been anywhere. So did anywhere you just start road. chasing after them on foot or did you jump in a car and follow that horse? We started, but I mean, it was hopeless. We, we lost, they are gone. You know, we thought, well, what are we going to do? So luckily, because I was still near home where I'd left from, I called the owner of the farm and she said, I'll come in the car and get your tack and help you. So she came in the car. And meanwhile, while I was walking up the road, some old boy stopped me in, in French and he said, I have horses. And I said, yes, he said, oh, I've just seen them in Espace. Um, so that's where we came from. And it was like a good 10 kilometers back. So they they just ran home. So luckily, I was able to alert the, la the landlady and she, her husband, who doesn't like horses very much, stood in the road with his arms out. 
and the horses just came back like with a big 15 minute get interval between them don't ask me how they ran 10 kilometers on the road and they went they went straight back so that was that was the start of that ride it was absolutely disastrous but the good thing about it was that had had we not have lost the horses and walked back on foot following our trail i would not have noticed that i had lost my big rope which had fallen off when we cantered down the, the field right so my rope was unbeknown to me had fallen off and it's such a critical piece of kit i'd never been able to replace it you know so um so had they not have run off i wouldn't have noticed i'd lost my rope so and they were fine i mean they didn't have a scratch on them or anything um it was just very very lucky and so that delayed us a day and we, we set off we set off the next day um again <laughs> so this, quiet, you know? <laughs> it, it sounds like i mean you sort of had in your mind a vision of what you were going to do and no matter what hardships were coming you just said you know what i'm i'm doing it well i don't think you know if the hardships had got just too great i might have given up but because it was a bit of an adventure and, I, and it was glorious weather it was very hot um you know and it was just so fascinating to ride the history of this trail you know the pilgrims trail is just such a wonderful trail and you know so you're you're actually at this point you've been in france for a little bit it's you know you said you had a mobile home it's it's like you're a local now yeah so i arrived at the end of june at this farm and i ended up kind of living there till um four weeks ago i just ended up there because it it was very difficult to leave it i mean it was very nice and um so the story goes on because basically we then rode on the pilgrims trail and we didn't again get as far as we had hoped to get and um we were plugging on through various places um you know down the ador valley which is very beautiful heading toward the Pyrenees, we got to the foothills of the Pyrenees, it got quite windy and quite quite climbing and and then again we had a little bit of a kind of a disaster um, that the husband of of the lady I'm riding with who was driving the trailer got sick, I mean you know, they, they he wasn't a well man but he just got too ill and he felt he couldn't continue so we had to stop short on that trail as well unfortunately uh see i didn't want to do it alone because um it's it's very hard without some support and not ha- knowing where you're going to stay at night i mean if i were doing it alone i could do it now but i'd want to know where i was staying at night yeah i can imagine so what was it like i mean you know you said that he would sort of scout out a place for you guys no he didn't scout out a place he was completely incapable of doing that. So okay. All he could do was just about drive the trailer and go and get food. And that's <laughs> what he did. And he didn't do anything like that like, because he was not a well man. So basically, we did all the work and we would just call him when we got to the end of the day and say, this is where we are. And he'd go and scout, but he hadn't any idea what to look for, really. Um, but what was good about, about the Pilgrim's Trail for, for me... Um, it's also called the Via Prudensis or the um, Camino de Santiago. It's a very popular route, not so much with horses, but with walkers. And so there is accommodation all the way down it. And so it was pretty easy to find somewhere to stay. And although it's not essentially for horses, they will accept horses because people come with donkeys. And so they've all got a little paddock. It's all the com- Jeets, or the pilgrim jeets they're called so they're kind of dormitories and <clears throat> people roll up to them about three in the afternoon and wash their socks and <laughs> you know and they have an evening meal cooked for them and they also have campgrounds so we were able to pretty much follow the pilgrims tra- trail jeets and they are very reasonably priced and there's always people there which is quite nice and so um we we, we did that so, but then, as I say, this one went wrong as well. Right. So the Camino, like you said, is very popular with hikers and walkers and like backpackers. So here yeah. you are on a horse and you rock up and, you know, you're staying in the same dorm, I guess, with these hikers. 
What did they think of you no, when they didn't. saw you? We didn't. No, we didn't stay in the dorm. We camped. We camped. Our, we did our own camping in, in, in the yard or garden or at the back of the property or whatever it was. They all had areas to camp. And were the locals or the camping? Camp. Were the hikers or the locals well, getting curious were. about you and asking questions? Or yeah, was... quite a lot. Quite a lot. But, you know, quite a lot were. Um, yes, it was lovely. We did talk to a lot of people. I mean, at one point we went into a car boot sale, <laughs> <laughs> rocked up on a car boot sale. That was that was the earlier week. Um, and, um, you know, that was wonderful because they had like beer and French fries. So that was the first thing we did bought you know i mean um and people gave us gifts and somebody made us a, a cafeteria of coffee and brought it over down the riverside for us and the people were loved somebody somebody gave us bread and people were great i mean french people are very hospitable in general and mostly you can just more or less go anywhere and people don't really shout at you like they do in england you know i mean in england you can what is the difference between France and the UK is the enclosures. And we have this Enclosures Act. So you don't have a right to roam in England. I don't really know if you've got a right to roam in France, but it's so big and so agricultural that nobody really bothers you. And we had one farmer came out and yell at us, that was it. Um, and we were only literally avoiding a heavy truck coming past. <laughs> That's why we were in the field. Um, but Nobody really bothered us in that way. Um, my horse became very adept. You know, in France, the the, the, the gère is very agricultural, and they grow massive crops of maize, sunflowers, and um, soya. But my horse became very adept at eating the maize. At first, he ate the whole plant, but then eventually he decided to just target the cob. And so <laughs> he, he, he would just straight in for the corn cob and he taught the other horse to do that <laughs> and that was his skill and um he, there's so much maize in france that i can't believe the farmer actually did come and tell us off but he said to, you know they came and warned us we shouldn't be eating it they said it's not fit for a horse but i mean you know that's a bit scary isn't it he said it's not fit for consumption <laughs> um so he had a lot of maize and a lot of grass so we, we didn't need to feed them again and that was that was great um, we did have some hay for them at that point because we had the trailer. Um, yeah, so that that was the Pilgrim's Trail, and it was a very beautiful trail. It goes through a lot of interesting places and visits a lot of churches. And you know, um, the people I went with were very English and like like their cup of tea. Um, so they always had to get the kettle on very quickly when <laughs> when we got there. And um, yeah, so so we didn't ride us. We would have had to take a break because my uh, realization is that the horse really can't do much more than a week without a break. And how many miles a day were you covering? Do you think? Well, sometimes we cover a kilometer. Sometimes we cover twenty. Sometimes we cover less. Um, we really never did more than twenty, maybe twenty-five on one day. Mostly, some days we only did about 10 because it was such hard going. And by the time we packed, you see, what took ages there was packing the electric fencing. That was very, very tiring because you've ridden a day and then you have to put up a corral. And that is tiring to get the horses fenced in, um, you know, and get water taken to them and all the rest of it. And then put the tent up and then cook your food. And, you know, it got very late at night and we'd just literally falling into bed and then up at dawn, you know, and get the fencing down and get the horses tacked up. And it, it all took forever. No, it, it's not as simple as you think it is, really. So so at this point, you said the other lady and the husband was having some health issues and it stopped. So yeah. now you're on your own again. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what did you do next? So I went back to the base um, in in, uh, in the farm. And uh, then what happened is it was October. And uh, my neighbours who'd been looking after my other horses said, well, look, we don't think we can look after your horses in the winter. So I thought, well, I'd better go home. So the farm I was on 
was had been put on the market to sell. You know, I could have I could have stayed there long term, but they decided to sell it. And the daughter, the friend of mine, with her horses, had left my poor Salvador, would have left him on his own. So I was like, what am I going to do? Because my horses in England need me, and my I, Salvador would be on his own, which he won't like, 100 acres, right, farm. So I was supposed to come home with, with that girl coming home, that woman, but I just couldn't face it. I was like, well, I just don't want to go back to UK. It was so warm and just mild and beautiful, and the riding was so nice, and you can't describe the riding well. It was wonderful. And um, I just decided to stay, so I got my other two horses brought out to France. And so they came out, and so, yeah, I rode both of them. So I I wasn't sure what to do after that, but it seemed to get harder when I had more horses to actually get off and ride because I didn't have anyone to really leave them with. And, and I had the dog. See, the dog was difficult because although he's a fabulous little dog and he follows the horses and he's really, really good, a lot of Francis rode, and they drive fast, and... Unless I was off on the trail, I didn't really feel that it was very safe for the dog. And I didn't want him to get hit by a car. So I was just trying to organise a lot of the time the dog, the horses, you know, what to do really. And then that was kind of, I never really got back on the trail um, because various things happened. Um, that made me have to come back to England, which I really regret. But on the other hand... No choice. Yeah, right, go. but so you're here in England now, and you're, uh, what's your, are your horses still in France, or did you bring them oh, back over? Or? No, what happened, which was the main deciding factor, so I wanted to, so what I thought I would do is leave Salvador out in France. If I could find somebody who would have him, I could leave him out there and I could go back out and ride him. And I had to come home because I've got elderly parents who, you know, needed me back. They were like sort of, you know, we've tolerated you having an adventure, but, we, you know, we're going to need you back now. Um, and then I, I had a grandson. That really was a determining factor. I had a, eight weeks ago, I had a lovely little grandson um, who's gorgeous. So I wanted to be involved with his life in my son. And then, but the main, and the house was sold. I mean, French houses take seven years to sell on average. But this one sold in a month. It was like shocking, you know, expected to be there for a long time. But so I had to find somewhere else to live. So given that I now had three horses out there, one in the UK, I have a house here which I hadn't sold, and a, a, a yard and a farm here in Dartmoor. And... Um, and uh, had a grandchild and parents and nowhere to live. But none of that was as important as what happened next, which was that my horse Salvador went lame because he had ruptured a tendon. And that was it, you know, end of riding. So your your horses are all still still there? No, they were all alone. So, so the other horse I had there is not a trail horse. He's a lovely horse, but he's a Western pleasure horse. And he's not really a confident trail horse. He's absolutely fine around the block, around the village, you know. But he's not a horse that I would want to go off on trail. He's, he's quite big, he's quite fast, and he's not really dependable like Salvador is. You know, he's not got the experience to or the confidence to go on trail with so, me. So you said you were in France for about a year? Yes. Yeah. And my trail horse got injured. I woke up one morning about eight weeks ago and he was hobbling. He was absolutely crippled. And I just thought, that doesn't look very good. And it didn't really kind of get any better. So I knew that he would not be being ridden for a long time, if again. So I just brought him back. I brought him all back um, and came home. Because of the family factors, I was very, I felt very isolated. I, there's only so long you can stay out, you know, in a country on your own with your animals, really. Uh, you know, if you can't buy a place or you haven't got support network or you haven't got family. And all my family and support is here in UK. So I 
pretty much decided I would have to come back. And because if I could have left Salvador out there, I would have left him out there uh, with somebody and gone out and continued the trail. You know, I would have gone further down and tried to get to Spain. That's what I would have liked to have done. And and now that you've um, had this sort of but, experience, I can imagine that, you know, as you said, it's it's beautiful and I can imagine that you're gone for so long, or a year you said, that it changes your perspective, yeah. you know, even when you come back to England. Are you now thinking of your next adventure or are you having ideas for, for the future or what what's next? I, I'm I'm very bored. Um I feel very at a loss. I feel like I don't know how to proceed without without the bond I ha- without that horse because he is the inspiration to me to, to really ride distance. Um, I mean, you know, we covered a lot of miles. I mean, in the end, between between riding and trailering it down, whatever we covered about, we've gone about four hundred miles down, um, and would have gone further had he not um, ruptured his tendon. You know, I, I would have left him there. And carried on on the trail next spring or well, this spring that would have been the plan to leave him out there because the right i love the riding then i love the countryside not necessarily lived out there permanently but you know he's not he's not going to make it again mm-hmm. um and i don't know if he he is getting better but i don't really see that he'd be able to do something like that again so now what i'm thinking is to go really to get my animals in a good base, which is where they are now, because I have my own man. Try to get someone to come and sit with them and spend more time myself going into other destinations, riding or doing horsey things, but not necessarily taking my own horse, because that's very complicated. And you know, you said that you had that Western fantasy riding into the prairie. Do you feel like you achieved that goal? That wasn't the goal of that trip. The goal of that trip was merely to ride my own horse in another country, to take him to another country, experience another culture, a different landscape, enjoy riding through a different environment. So I feel I achieved that, and I feel it was great for both me and the horse. And the fact that he had this accident, I don't know how we had it or even what happened, um, was a kind of a natural ending to that because had he not have got injured i wouldn't have brought him home somehow find a way to leave leave him there because it doesn't inspire me to ride in britain even though i live on dartmoor but i've been there done that and got the t-shirt you know many people would just love to ride on dartmoor it's fabulous but to me it doesn't do it for me anymore it's too cold and you know i just i just don't like it (laughs) um so I, I, I'll have to look to either go back to France and borrow the possibility or and continue on the trail on, on another horse, not mine, and that's possibly what I'm going to do, to ride in different countries and to to go more to the States, which is where my it's like my spiritual homeland. And I just feel right when I'm in the States. And, you know, what I do in my life is not really well understood in the UK. It's not, I'm, nobody can generally really relate to it because this, the culture of equestrianism in the UK is just so traditional. And, you know, people don't really ride. Some do, but mostly, you know, it's not a nomadic kind of a, a culture. Um, it's very, very rigid and traditional horsemanship. So I don't really feel that I can be me very easily. No, definitely. I mean, I can relate. Yeah, I think that's part of the whole thing about being an adventurous is once you start traveling and you get the travel bug, you realize, I mean, your eyes are now open to the world and it's really hard to stop and go back to the people that don't have their eyes open. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, all I, all I feel now is my horse is a set. They're in a good place. Salvador is recovering. I don't know how long it'll take. He's had loads and loads of... I treat with herbs. You know, he's on on natural... I'm a a medical herbalist, so I treat with natural herbs and and remedies. Um, I feel he's improving. The others, they looked great in France. 
And so I have to tell you, I mean, the, it was good for them on one level. They they were very, very feisty and full of themselves. You said, you know, at the beginning of the podcast that you're you're 60. And I think most people at this age wouldn't be thinking about going on grand adventures on horseback. 67. I'm 67. 67. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm 67. But the thing is, well, I'm quite, I'm quite a young 67, yeah, I think. But the, the thing is, I have a very low boredom uh, threshold and or high boredom threshold. And I just, I just find England very boring. And although I love my family and I, I love certain things and my friends and I, I feel I'm part of it, it's just so boring and the land has no energy. And, you know, there are places to ride but it just doesn't do it for me. There's something inside of me that just wants to have adventures in other places. And, and do you... <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah, do you have any advice for, I don't know, maybe women that are in a similar situation like you or they're thinking about doing something like this, they would love to go and take their horse to another country and ride, but they just haven't done it yet? What's What's your advice, especially as a... Yeah, well, and my advice is get rid of your husband right? <laughs> because they stuff you. <laughs> yeah. And just bloody do it. Just do it. You know what I mean? Just just do whatever you want to do. Do it. But when you get to your 60s, you do not want to really tie yourself down too much because there's always a reason why you can't do it. There's always something stopping you from, from challenging horizons. I mean, for me, when I first... I just rode out on that four-day ride on Dartmoor. I was so sad that first time. I was like, oh, my God, can I do this? You know, and then, but it was easy, really. And then when I got to France, I was, like, so scared. I was like, oh, let's not do it. Let's just stay here, you know. But we did it. And and I think, you know, each day that you think on an adventure like that, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say mine was the greatest adventure, but for somebody of my age and, you know, my own horse as well, we had fun. You know, we, had, we just had fun. I've had the most exciting year. And now I feel very fed up and bored. But on the other hand, I have my little grandson and, you know, I have peace and quiet. I don't, I haven't, I haven't got, like, I'm not anxious about things because, because it's much easier, you know. I mean, it was very difficult in France. A lot of it was very hard, knowing where I was going to be and if the horses were okay and speaking French. And if I needed a vet, and what would happen if something went wrong, and all this stuff, you know, um, quite scary to be in another culture with your animals. Um, in France, is very different, you know. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, but you know, to women of my age, I would say like just, just because otherwise yeah. you'll regret it. And keep doing it, really. Keep challenging your horizons. I mean. I need to think of something to do now. I probably ought to write for a bit and maybe hole up for the winter. But I definitely got to go somewhere again and do something. Yeah, it sounds otherwise, it, you know, boring. It, yeah, it sounds like your adventures are only beginning. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm happy that I did it, and I'm happy that I got back in one piece. In, you know, although I'm very sad that my horse got injured, he didn't get injured on the trail. He got injured in the field, you know, eight months afterwards. So I don't think we can really, we can really say that that was the problem. But you know what I love? This is what I love. I love seeing different places every day. I absolutely love to, in, whether I'm on a bike or a horse, you know, or or, 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 or an RV, whatever, it's just, I can't bear staying still. I can't. I'm not a settler. I don't want to live anywhere, really. I mean, if I live anywhere, I'm like, I don't want to live there very long. You know, I, I just want to go. I just want to go. So I don't really mind, you know, even though I'm considering a bike and riding a bike with a dog and going back to France or Spain and riding a bike, you know, it, I'd rather a horse. But on the other hand, a bike is a bit less complicated. <laughs> and you know you've been in france for a year do you have a recommendation or a, a place that just really took your breath away that you know it, it, somebody who hasn't been to france is like yeah. yes that's that's a special place that you need to go yeah i go to rocamador which is 
is um, in the, just uh, in the door in the Dordogne. It's, it's a UNESCO site, historical site. I mean, it's like some, something out of a fairy tale. It is absolutely, totally incredible. Um, the Atlantic coast is very good to ride down the beach. Uh, the land forest is wonderful to ride in, although we didn't. Um, I found it a bit scary, the forest that goes on and on. It's the largest forest. Um, but definitely Rock on the Door. And then where else? You know, the Pyrenees are spectacular. The foothills of the Pyrenees, um, where the pilgrim comes down to the beginning of the Pyrenees there. That's pretty amazing. Um, so that's as far as I got, really. <laughs> France is enormous. And, and the riding's just great everywhere. It's a lot of uh, bridle paths and, and trails to ride. Um, and not much traffic and not many people. And uh, more or less anywhere you ride in France is good. But the flies are bad. You know, the flies do start in, in end of June and they are pretty horrible. Uh, they're, they're big. <laughs> so the horses don't like them. So, uh, yeah, but pretty pretty much uh, all of France is pretty beautiful. I, I can't say that you ever see a bad view. There's a lot of medieval bastides, you know, up high on hills. Um, just stunning plant life. And it's just you've got so much more energy than Britain and so fewer people. I mean, Britain can be very beautiful too, but it's very busy and it's very hard to ride in this country because the roads are so busy. I feel like a cowgirl. I'm in, I went to Denver a couple of years ago and I was like, oh, I'm home. <laughs> this is it. And yet I'm English. So, you know, and, and I have this ranch, but it's like too cold. And, <laughs> you know, I don't know. The key, is, the key is really to be happy with what you have, isn't it? But I, that's very difficult for me. <laughs> yeah, for, for people with goals and aspirations, it's, it's hard to be. Yeah. Well, this has been very lovely to to hear your adventures and your stories, and I hope that your horse gets, uh, I don't know, that it recovers and that you can start some more adventures in the future. Thank you. I have to, because otherwise what else is there? You know, there's, there's, only, there's only death, isn't there? No <laughs> death. So I, I want to stay as long as I can because, you know, as you say, my adventure's only just started. I've got to think of what to do next. I mean, I know you've got some very exciting things, things there like Jordan with the donkey and Costa Rica was there and Mexico and just amazing things um but this was all about my taking my own horse which is why it you know it was a little bit like of a tamer thing I think it would be much easier to have somebody else's horse to do it on really well definitely no I think I think what you did is amazing I mean like you said not knowing where you're going to sleep at night or where you're going to put your horse I think that in itself is the Um, biggest fear of anyone starting a journey like what you did but the horse was great you know wherever he was he was just fine (laughs) he was just okay he was just he's such a good boy Uh, I definitely would give a shout out to Argentine Criollos as a breed go on a trail ride on a trek definitely look for a criollo they are so great for that kind of thing you know they're not flighty or fussy at all they just get on with the job i don't know if you know of um a book called shifley's ride i'm absolutely yes. mad on equestrian travel books here well he took two criollos who'd never been broken in one was like 15 and one was like 16 or something and he rode them from patagonia to Washington DC in the like 1920s. Yeah. And that now that was an that was an adventure. That no, was, yes, I adventure. I've read that book as well when I was young. Actually, that definitely made me like dream of of some grand adventure very similar. So that's that's a very good inspirational yeah. book. Yeah. There was not much so horrible in France in modern day really like that. But. Uh, you know, I, I just, I've been reading those kind of books for years and I just, like, that was, was all I read. The question, I, I wouldn't, oh, if it was a camel, I didn't want to know. There's like some girls went with the camel. I was like, no, that's not, it's something about the horse that, you know, does it for me. So um, I just love those books. Perfect. In Romania, that's where I think I'd like to go. Ooh, that's a good yeah. one. I actually lived in Romania for about six months and oh, it's a you? beautiful country. Yeah. Oh, did yeah. you ride there? Yeah, I was working. I worked there at two different stables, um, so I've been there twice. Well, I've been there a few times. 
Um, but the best thing about Romania is there's no fences. You can go wherever. It's it's a uh... France. That's the same with France. Yeah, see, that's good. Well, I might go there because that's where my grandma's from. <laughs> yeah, and that's where the horse comes from. In my blood, I think it's from Romania. The farming horsey thing. So I might go there, but we'll see anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, you have to, yeah, Romania is good. And I know some people, so <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> it was lovely to talk to you. It well, thank nice you. make contact. And uh, I love what you're doing. Carry on the good work. You have been listening to the Equestrian Adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website, equestrianadventuresses.com, for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.